Thank you for joining us for this fireside chat with two transformative CIOs who formerly served in the Department of Defense. They will share their perspectives on the challenges and priorities facing today's CIOs from their own experiences and unique perspective. We'll then talk through the tools, processes, and tactics that will prove useful in meeting these challenges, both individually and holistically, with a new way of viewing software as a service and platform that enable an enterprise approach to better utilizing data. I'm Aaron Kinworthy, Area Vice President of Federal Sales for ServiceNow, and I am thrilled to have retired Lieutenant General Susan Lawrence and Bill Marion with me today on our fireside chat. Together, they have collectively served over 2.2 million end users with transformative and modern IT services. Today, they will share their insights into the past, the present, and the future of information management and use in the Department of Defense, and where others can start and or continue their own journey. We are honored to have them both here today, sharing their experiences. Retired Lieutenant General Susan Lawrence served in J-6 under two major combat operations, both Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. She helped develop the U.S. Army's Cyber Command and worked directly with senior staff members, including the Secretary of Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army, to reduce costs, improve the effectiveness of cyber, and other IT solutions. She also served as the Commanding General for the Army Network Enterprise Technology Command, NETCOM, where her responsibilities included overseeing the Army, C4, and Army Enterprise IT functions. She currently leads the Accenture Federal Services Armed Force Portfolio within the national security practice. Good morning, Aaron. Thank you so much to you and ServiceNow for including me in this fireside chat. Thank you for joining us. Our other panelist is Bill Marion. He served as a U.S. Air Force Deputy Chief Information Officer, overseeing the Air Force's IT portfolio, and served previously as Chief Technology Officer for the Air Combat Command and Air Force Space Command. He led 54,000 cyber personnel globally, an operation budget valued at $17 billion and forced on leading Air Force digital transformation investments, particularly across enterprise IT, cloud computing, next generation cybersecurity approaches, and mobile device centric collaboration. He currently leads growth and strategy in the defense and intelligence practice of Accenture Federal Services. Bill, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate the opportunity and certainly the partnership with ServiceNow. Well, welcome to our fireside chat. Thank you both for your service. I'm excited to get started. Susan, let's start with you. Based on your experiences, what do you see as the major challenges today for the current CIOs in the Department of Defense? Thank you, Aaron. Uh, yes, these are obviously extraordinary times uh, and it is uh, really put some challenges on our current CIOs as we've, uh, as we've gone forward. Uh, the one thing that I think about, obviously, is COVID. Uh, when it hit us, you know, in one day, everybody flipped the switch and sent everybody home. And I know that uh, Bill wants to expand on this because I was working in Air Force projects specifically and being able to VPN in and still do real-time work in Safe Agile with our scrum teams turned into a, a, a bit of a challenge, but the Air Force's response was amazing as we went forward. And that's kind of what I think about today. I remember when I was serving as the CIO G6, the challenges that we went through and, and trying to modernize uh, our, our services was really critical at that time uh, because we were still you know, in the industrial age and not the technology age as we were going forward. And then I retired and I went to work for industry and I, I ended up telling people in a lot of spe uh, speeches I gave what I learned in my first six months as the uh, as in industry, I wish I would have known when I was the CIO G6 because I would have done things differently. I was one of the, the hard stand individuals who had the Heisman hand up when it came to having commercial solutions. Um, we, were in, we were in two major combat operations at the time. Um, I had to have the ability to control and extend the services all the way to that soldier, sailor, airman, marine, in, uh, sitting in Salerno, Afghanistan. And so I just couldn't see how commercial solutions could, could help me with that. 
Now I get into industry and I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> because the industry can do these things so quickly, have the massive resources to do the research and development of what is needed uh, in a combat operation. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But I'm almost at the point today that I see think everything is a service. Um, because when you think about the skill sets of the personnel, and how fast our technology is changing and being able to reskill a team, the tools that change every day, it is, it's almost um, in, a, in a large organization like the Department of Defense, commercial solutions are the real winner here for us. You brought up an interesting point, which is the connection between the operational experiences that you gained, right, and the lessons of today. Bill, would you care to share your inputs as well? I think you have a unique experience. Yes, and kind of to expound upon what, what Susan is, is saying as well, is that there's a couple dimensions that CIOs are always challenged with. Uh, scale and speed is first and foremost in the mind. But when you put the scale again to that 2.x million users that we both uh, both lived the dream of, of supporting, right? You, you have to get the price point. And so this, this as a service mantra brings all of those elements together. Also, it, it starts to bring in the user experience at a whole nother elevated level. So no longer it's legacy, lethargic, uh, oftentimes just not coordinated systems into platforms that can really drive that, that modernization, that digital modernization that starts bringing in legacy, starts uplifting your user experience, also reducing the cost. And, and to Susan's point, what I, what I see now on the industry side that I thought on my government side that's really come true is this model is you really have to drive the true transformation to get there. The scale we're dealing with, you, you, you have to fundamentally look at these platforms to, to really revolutionize a lot of the business practices. That's, only, that's the only way you're really gonna, gonna get the scale and speed that, that you really need to get to. And then on the, on the COVID front, I mean, the, the, the piece that always resonated with me was this, you know, the government is really good about putting people on processes. We're, we're not so great on using platforms to really accelerate and let the people do what uniquely people have to do. And so, again, these platforms have really accelerated our ability to, to deliver at speed, to bring a new user experience and, and really drive an agility that, um, that, frankly, COVID needs, right? You left the Pentagon, you're working from home. So how do we start giving this self-service uh, kind of process end to end. And, and frankly, if you don't have the platform, it, it's it's horrifically difficult. So I think end to end kind of weaving all of that together, that's that's really the era when we're in with respect to, to digital modernization. It's, it's really a center core. Thank you for that input from both of you. I think it's insightful and you bring up some very valid points. And it, yeah, I think, you know, current CIOs uh, can really value the input that you're providing and the experience that you've had. Bill, Similar question. People are trying to get work done, and in doing so, they're not buying technology as efficiently as they could. Moreover, with everyone being remote, as everyone is right now, the business processes are changing before our eyes. Is this more of a problem today, given that so much digitalization is happening in response to COVID-related, and is it changing work? Uh, great, great question, Aaron. I, I would say is, there's a couple angles to that, and I'll, I'll address two principal ones. Um, first and foremost, I, I do think the adoption to these platforms to really revolutionize process has started. Uh, I, I think over the last year or two, uh, the, the commercial adoption inside the government has really uh, ramped up in this space. I, I still believe it's, it's still very vertically oriented. Uh, it, these platforms can go very horizontal, but we still have a lot of vertical implementations, if you will. Uh, and so I think really the next step within this is Again, from a user experience, they want a holistic experience. They don't want go to this system, go to this system, go to this system, even if it's the same platform, but they're not connected. And so I, I think the next step that we're talking about in, in, in this COVID era is how to better seamlessly and enterprise level integrate. Uh, that's certainly a core capability of Accenture that we really like to uh, we really pride ourselves on because that again, at that scale, we do this internally for our company every single day. We bring together HR, we bring together our, our back-end financials, we bring in all of those systems into a, a seamless experience, single sign-on, those kind of things that, again, make us the most efficient and effective we can. So I, I think that's really the next step um, as, as we've deployed these platforms out across the DOD and the federal space uh, that we really have to tackle. The, the other aspect that I think uh, is really just ripe for opportunity here 
is really the, the next generation of BPA and RPA or business process um, re-engineering and, and of course the robotic process automation pieces. Um, and there's a lot of appetite there. There's people dipping their toes in it, uh, especially in the RPA business. But when you start again, talking about a workforce that's much more remote, oftentimes you're, the, the workforce numbers are decreasing just in general. And so how do you use automation and commercialization of these platforms to then elevate your workforce up to the next set of delivery? And so I, I think the next year is gonna be big for us, uh, especially in the partnership with ServiceNow on, on the RPA space, the robotic process automation, because there, there's so many things ripe for that, that uh, re-engineering inside of the government. I agree. Things are changing right in front of us every second. So it's an exciting time to be a part of it. Susan, what is the best way to capitalize on this desire to innovate while ensuring it's done in a way where the technology is being used actually efficiently as well? Yeah, Aaron, that's a, that's a great question. And, and how individuals move forward in different environments is really key here. You know, when you are in the commercial environment, it, it's easier to say, okay, we're going to go to this platform, we're going to go to this service, and we're going to make that work. In the Department of Defense, it, it can't ever be a stop and go uh, kind of a thing because you have real world missions going on every day. And so how do you introduce those new transformation, those new ways of doing business. And uh, this is what I like about uh, our platform services uh, and the certain apps that we're getting after. Uh, I am absolutely convinced, uh, again, having now served in uniform and on, on this side of our business, is commercial solutions are absolutely critical for a number of reasons. Um, Bill gave, recently just gave some great examples. You know, being able to use RPAs and instead of having an individual look at, sit at a help desk and answer a phone, we can bring in technologies that we can then move that, that uh, soldier or airman to something else that is more important to do as we do that. And so automation, commercialization, um, virtualization. So as folks are now making the move to the cloud, uh, it can't all be done at one time. The Department of Defense is huge. And so what we look at is then doing other solutions such as virtualization, which then removes risk as we're delivering certain capabilities. And all of these things lead to uh, a more secure environment. And that's really the ultimate uh, goal that we want to get to. Every solution that we look at when we're um, working with our clients and see what their complex problems are, we build in security up front, and that's key in transformation and innovation as well uh, in the type of business that we're in today. That's insightful. Thank you, Susan. And Bill, with your experience at the Air Force, I'm sure um, you, you have some good examples as well. What do you think can be done to capitalize on this desire to innovate and use technology efficiently? Yeah, absolutely. And, and kind of expound upon what Susan's saying is that I think the platform side brings you a fabric. It brings you a foundation that is really fundamental to transformation. Um, so often we think very vertically, we acquire very vertically, uh, we, we require requirement by requirement and the platform um, kind of approach starts to think of as, as a foundation and a fabric that really glues everything together. Because you, you can't go end to end on day one, you can't get rid of legacy quickly. And so being able to provide that fabric, be able to transition legacy capabilities off, bring in new capabilities, but, but allow that same fabric and tone and tenor for that platform to be consistent, to be agile, to be very mobile centric, I think is really the game changer here. Um, it, it, until you get past the vertical mentality, both in acquisition and in requirements, I, I think folks are really challenged by that. And we see that very consistently. So as I talked to you before, is bringing that enterprise approach, thinking holistically of, solving specific challenges, right? You have to get wins within your deployments, but also thinking holistically about how this thing will fit end to end. And when you think about uh, the value in cybersecurity and HR and all the way down to IT configuration management and all those elements, we've thought of those things vertically and now you can start to horizontally integrate. And so to Susan's point, your security is better, your user experience is better, and your ability to offload legacy systems becomes much more um, robust and agile as you go through. But it's that fabric and foundation that I think is, is really where everybody needs to be, be driving to. I think you're right. And, and what's impressive 
from both uh, of your all's work and what we're seeing is that you're incorporating security and user experience and these this fabric of um, the different technologies into the forefront of the solution, right? As opposed to being an afterthought and buying the technology then trying to make it work. And I think you guys have both uh, done a great job of that in your prior service. And obviously our partnership with Accenture, we continue that. And I think it's a, a transformational way to look at how we do IT as a business. And I think you guys have, have both exemplified that. So help the CIOs of today out. How do you do an implementation that's both clean and sustainable? Bill, let's start with you and some of the experiences that you've had. Yeah, well, I think the example of Department of State is one that I would uh, kind of highlight here because I think it, it truly starts to orchestrate all of this end to end. Uh, you know, when you look at, again, Department of State, huge number of systems uh, in the backside of, of everything they do. How do you provide that holistic experience around what they call my services, which is the integrated platform? So, again, they couldn't just rip and replace. They had to start small, scale up. And so first off, how do you tackle the legacy systems? How do you provide that clean user interface from the beginning, even though you're not changing the backend systems? And so that's, that's to me, step one, especially in the federal space where there's so much technical debt uh, involved. Then you start to really take those wins and start to either, because of cost efficiencies, I'll call it in the, the, the legacy system and truly integrate them into the platform, or just recognize that that monolithic system is gonna stay there for some amount of time and continue to refine and improve the service offerings there on, that, that you're delivering. And so over time, right, the, the buildup of multiple, if not a hundred plus services really starts to take ground, but the user really doesn't know what's going on behind the hood, right? Because they, they really don't need to and you don't, you don't want them to. You want them to just be able to interface with the system, interact, and so now globally, uh, you know, hundreds of, of locations worldwide, hundreds of services being uh, delivered through this common platform, and multi-billion dollars worth of transactions going over a single fabric, um, and really providing that game-changing capability. Again, you know, in our traditional models, we would have gone out and done a multi-year, 10 Moore's Law uh, scenario. Uh, we'd be talking five to 10 years of deployments, and you know, hopefully it's successful at the end, but it's kind of the waterfall kind of piece. It, it truly is an agile approach to platform as a service to, to get the wins, build the momentum, get that, that return on investment to invest in the next service and the next service. But again, that unifying whole, uh, depending on whether you're coming in mobile or traditional approach. Uh, again, I think that's really the value of the platform. And so, uh, Everybody should be aware of Department of State's a pretty big beast, uh, lots of different branches and sequels. And so unifying a, a, an experience like that, uh, I, frankly, is one of our, our big spotlight uh, scenarios because it's, it, it, it kind of brings that end to end with respect to governance and legacy and UX and mobile and cloud all into one ecosystem. That was a, a good example. And we're very proud of that uh, work that we've done together with both Accenture Federal Services and ServiceNow. Uh, Susan, I want to give you an opportunity as well. You know, uh, implementations are important, right? Platforms don't work unless they're implemented properly. Uh, what are some examples that you have and some insight you can share for current CIOs today? Yeah, as Bill was talking, it reminded me of a slide that I use uh, with our clients on why a platform? Why are we looking for this single fabric as we're going forward? So I pulled that real quick to look at it. And it really is all about energizing the user and making that user experience uh, more important. It's getting rid of siloed solutions. Um, it, 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 for the client, it truly drives costs down, which we all need to do uh, with our budgets. And it accelerates results um, as you're doing that. So you're looking on the return on investment of moving to a platform service to be able to deliver these things. Um, these things come out as well. And by the way, it really helps us foster innovation. Uh, helps us move them from that legacy environment that they're in today to a new environment that's much more uh, profitable. And, and then we don't talk profit in the Department of Defense, so that's really not the right word, but um, really can accelerate their experiences as we move forward. Um, and I remember, you know, being a young soldier, I enlisted as a private. And, and all the way through my service, when, every time I moved to a new station, it was painful. I had to get a new computer. I had to get new passwords. I had to get new access cards. I had to, to move, you know, figure out how, you know, that all my pay records got moved. 
And, um, and it, oh, it took days before I actually got my password that I could go to work and find my desk to go to work. So now when you think about bringing in a single um, platform environment, a single workflow, that when a soldier reports to a station and it's a one-stop shop to get everything done in the single day, that, that helps orientate that individual into like, this is a pretty cool place. And that's not only in the Department of Defense, but it's also in the commercial environment. How we onboard our new hires, it's critical that they have that first positive experience of becoming part of the team. And that's what a platform like this can do. Around that, um, that, that platform that Susan's talking to is a thing we call living platforms. It's a, it's a very responsive and UX centric uh, delivery model. And so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with Susan more on that one. I mean, when I joined Accenture, right, I never saw a help desk. I had a, I had a laptop. I knew exactly when UPS was going to ship it. It was mirrored. It was imaged. Um, the, the help desk piece was just seamless, single factor uh, sign on or uh, multi factor uh, uh, sign on there. It, that holistic experience is what I experienced from day one. And we, we deliver that in, in concert with ServiceNow through the living platforms uh, capability. And so when you think mobile and HR and finance, that's exactly, Susan's right, that's exactly the experience that every, that 18 year old is demanding, right? Um, and, and we'll probably talk about this more as we go through, but it's a retention and recruiting issue as Susan talks to, absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. And the end user doesn't care nor understand what's happening in the background, right? It's about the, the, the experience that they're getting. And you both mentioned silos. And, you know, technology and, and especially IT departments and CIOs, they have to face silos. They're not going to break them down day one, and they're probably never going to break them all down. And so what we've noticed with the platform is that you have technical battles and you have political battles, right? To have a platform that can play nicely with others and not have to fight the political battle all the time and show things work in a short period of time and get those small wins that you both mentioned is important to get that groundswell and that buy-in with end-user positive experience. Then all of a sudden, the CIOs of today have a groundswell of people that agree with them, that get a good experience. And next thing you know, it makes it much easier to fight those political battles and break down some of those silos where it's important for the modernization of the organization. So I, I agree with you both and appreciate the insight you've provided. So Susan and Bill you have highlighted that the most important aspect of anything we do in the IT world is around people. And so... What I'd like to know from your perspective is what impact does a platform have on the approach of the workforce in today's terms and looking forward? Yeah, thank you, Aaron. I, I think I'll kick that off first for you. Um, again, as we discussed before, the advantages of having a, a single fabric, as Bill calls it, calls it in the platform, is our ability to quickly bring the best of commercial solutions to the government as we move forward with this. And that includes taking care of our people uh, and our workforce. And in Accenture, we have this process in our, in our studios that we call human centered design. And, and I absolutely loved that when I came here to Accenture. And what we literally do is put the soldier, the airman, uh, the sailor, the Marine at the center of the problem and then design out the solutions. Too often times we end up inside of the Pentagon, if you will, or a headquarters somewhere, and we try to resolve the problems um, out in Kandahar or uh, wherever we're going, Mosul, Mosul uh, Iraq. Um, putting the, the individual at the center is what's key in, in us being able to develop these platforms so that it meets the user's needs and not necessarily the building's needs, if you will, as we go forward. And we call, also call it co-create. So whenever we are going after a hard, complex problem, we work it with the client together to find the solution. And so with that, that's why the people part is so critical. When we think about the skill sets that we're gonna need in the future as we uh, continue to expand on platform solutions, um, how we're gonna, we're gonna reskill them is, is very important. You know, and I, I'm working on one uh, project right now, and uh, it's surrounded by the need for additional cybersecurity workforce. And I read a study that showed there are going to be 3.5 million cybersecurity vacancies in the year 2021. 
So it's not just uh, us here at Accenture facing the problem. It's the commercial environment. It's the government as we do that. And so as um, I often speak and talk about the, the challenges that we're finding there, I am convinced that it's going to take a joint effort between the government, industry, and academia to go after these problems to continue to make sure that we have the right talent where we need them as we go forward. Yeah, and Aaron, to, to jump on, on that one with, with Susan, the couple, couple angles to add. Um, I, I often talk about my son, he's 15 years old, and I mean, he's really taught me a lot about what that new digital, truly, truly digital native is. And, and frankly, they demand that agile, responsive, human in the center mix, because frankly, that's the only thing he grew up with. And so to have anything else, is just unacceptable. So we talk about recruiting and retention of airmen, soldiers, sailors, that, that human-centered design, that user experience, that customer experience is so critically important. You could almost argue it's more important than all of the capabilities. So in other words, if I had 10 capabilities with no UX, I would rather deliver seven capabilities with a strong UX platform, right? Because if they won't interact with the platform, it doesn't matter what you delivered if it's not usable. It's refreshing to hear you uh, both of you talk about the human aspect of this, right? It's not actually about the technology and the compassion that we have for the experience that people have is what allows for that adoption, and that transformation. Uh, you know, I think you, you both said it in, you know, in the service now terms, uh, it, it's about not throttling people with technology, but enabling them, right? If we do it right, they actually don't appreciate what we did because it feels seamless, right? If they can order books online and have it delivered in two days, that's no different than an SLA. They don't mind what plane and how much jet fuel was on there and what we had to do to get it there. We promised and we delivered. And I think that's what you're seeing out of IT today, whether it's for the warfighter, whether it's for recruitment, every aspect is about the impact of the human. And so that customer experience is really important. I think Bill and you, Susan, you both said it, but we do have customers, right? And we have to see them that way because they do have choices. And so that next generation is gonna have that big impact. I think that's very insightful. Thank you both for that. Absolutely. Yeah, Aaron, you know, you just hit on it as well. You know, very seldom as we go out and we work with our clients, do we find that technology truly is the challenge? It, it's the culture. And what is culture? It's the people. Um, when I was a CIO, I had a sign in my office that said, change is good. You go first. And so getting people to buy in <laughs> and accept the movement to bring in innovation and to transform how we do business, um, it, 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 it starts and ends with the people. Yeah, my, yeah. my favorite quote there, Aaron, was, uh, and I can't remember the speaker, so I can't give them credit, but they said, it's unfortunate that in DOD, users expect that when they come into work, they're gonna go 10 years back in time. And, and I always use that as kind of a platform. So that's just simply unacceptable anymore. That, that's not our job as CIOs. We need, to, we need to expect that they come in and they get, to your point, that rich experience from, from the get-go where they don't even understand the complexities behind the hood, if you will. But they, they come in, they get the experience they want, they're happy when they get home. They had a great day at, at work because frankly, the mission that we have is the empowering part. And the more we take the laborious side out of the equation and the more they can focus on the mission, uh, there's a huge retention and, and, and development opportunity there uh, in the space. And so people don't normally tie those together, uh, but none of us have extra free hours in the day. So if we can shed those things that aren't productive, aren't valuable and really get to where, you know, we get to use our intellect and skills and, and really talents, that's what really energizes us all, I, I believe. Yeah, you bring up a good point. You know, you always hear the 80-20 rule. Uh, when you talk about transformational organizational change, uh, we commonly use the 10-60-10 the rule, which is you got 60% in the middle and they're waiting to see if the top 10% who adopt change first are going to win or if the 10% at the bottom that cross their arms and are never willing to adopt any kind of change are really going to win that battle. And so it goes back to what you said, uh, Bill and Susan, about quick wins, right? A good experience that shifts that large mass and common uh, body back towards the modernization and the initiatives that you put in place for the current and future CIOs. So I, I agree with you. Let's move on to a hot topic right now, which is uh, AI and machine learning, right? It's all the buzzwords. Uh, what I'd like to know, and especially from your background, and your insights uh, that you've had is, um, how do you CIOs start making a shift to a platform approach when it comes to AI and ML? 
Bill, maybe we can start with you and, and your thoughts on that. Yeah, Aaron, I would, uh, um, I'm going to answer that maybe a little bit unconventionally, but I get a lot of head nods when I say this is it's, it's not first and foremost about AI and ML. It's first about data. And it's a really simple statement, but it's actually pretty stinking hard to, to do in the DoD, whether that's data ownership issues, cultural issues, system legacy issues. And so what, what we found a lot of success in working with, frankly, all the services right now. So we have great work at the OSD level, Air Force, Navy, Army, on various initiatives to really root out the pains, trials, and tribulations and governance around data. And that to me is all the foundational elements. And so even some of the examples Susan brought forth with, with respect to cyber as an example, when you can start truly bringing the data in, the sensors, the integration into a common platform, then you start really arming yourself for the chatbot technologies and the RPA and the BPA tools that really start to accelerate. Uh, but what I've seen, unfortunately, I think in, in too often is we go after a niche EA, AI ML capability. It solves a particular need, but again, it solves a vertical. It doesn't scale well. So my, my urging to everyone when I talk to them is the proverbial, and it's overused a little bit, but focus on your data, focus on bringing that ecosystem together in some kind of common framework or fabric, because once you've done that, your, your ability to lay algorithms, tools, capabilities on top of it, uh, now become game changers instead of incremental wins. Yeah, uh, I remember doing a study uh, on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and it actually started back in the 50s, where uh, it was asked, can the machine really learn? And can they really come up with solutions for us? And so what we found over the years, it, it would start building the hype on it again, and then it would just go away. And this this hyperloop has gone on to the point that my question was, and I wrote an article on it, you know, is AI and ML here to stay today? I mean, do we have enough momentum and, and uh, the way ahead to make it happen? And my, I think the answer is yes. And it's because of what Bill said. It's, it's all about the data and getting to the right data and having access to it. And, and again, being repeatable in an environment that can be repeatable and standardized and automated um, and this is why I think that uh, AI and ML will stay here this time. And it really is about taking the human out of the loop where you can and get machine to machine. That's when you'll have the, the real truth and confidence in the data that you're seeing um, versus the human reporting it. And we, we see that um, as we look at one of the big things that I'm excited about is our data analytics work we're doing today to be predictive in what we're going to be able to see in the future. And that's where I get excited about our introduction of, of uh, machine learning and being predictive as we go f forward. And it's even more than that. I remember an Air Force client asked me, he says, I want you to come do some work on me. It's all about data veracity. What's truth? And, you know, when you think about all the data fields and, uh, that have to be cleaned up out there as we go forward to get to predictive analytics, you know, you know, in one system, I'm Susan Lawrence. In the next system, I'm Susan S. Lawrence. Next system, I'm Lieutenant General Lawrence. I mean, so what is the true data that we can standardize and be predictive on as we go forward? I think you're both spot on, right? Uh, the ServiceNow platform, you know, the way that we categorize it is workflow. Right. If you can't get those two data points to connect and have that information, the decisions can't be made. And you both brought up a really important point. It's been a common theme throughout this entire fireside chat, which is it's still about the human. It's still about the end experience of being able to be predictive to make the right choices. Right. And uh, the second part of that would be the data. Right. If you don't have fidelity in the data and you're not able to have that data flow between the systems and have that workflow properly integrate with your current environment, your systems, what's the point? And, and I do think, Bill, you mentioned it and Susan as well, that we're in an age where the data collection is getting so voluminous that we have to have that automation and that workflow has to be there so that we can start making the critical decisions and let the machines uh, interact in, in uh, you know, speed of light. So uh, I don't know if you have anything more to add to that, but uh, you know, I think you guys have touched on some really important points that are unique to the vision of AI and ML that most people don't talk about. I would just add the uh, to your your question or your statement around size and mass of data. I think that that is exactly I would call it. It's if it's not the number one, it's in the top three of key issues inside the DoD space. And it, 
again, having a common fabric where you can incrementally build in that space versus continuing to rebuild the verticals, if you will. I always refer to kind of the verticals and the horizontals. You've got a horizontal fabric that you can keep injecting and integrating uh, the vertical capabilities from a data perspective. And then you can incrementally build again wins, uh, build successes, build integrated products, and then continue to, to add and iterate from there. Look at cyber, right? There's tons of censoring that we could bring in, but how do you bring it as a platform to start there and continue to mature through that process? Um, any platform has almost got to live in your own maturity model, meet you where you're at, and then accelerate you into transformation. And, and again, that's, that's kind of the, the center of the discussion here. So the technology is available, and we've highlighted numerous times how important the people are uh, to this implementation. What I'd like to know, and what I think is important for the CIOs of today, is for you to share your experiences of where did they start making the shift and, and begin the transformation and, and, and get your input there. Susan, let's start with you. Well, what advice do you have for current CIOs? Yeah, I uh, recently did a panel with, uh, with Aaron Weiss, the CIO of the Navy, and Ms. Knossenberger, the Deputy CIO of the Air Force. And I told them both that I was, uh, you know, when you're a general officer, you, you never come off the rolls and you can be recalled back to duty. And I told them I'm, I'm ready to get my recall orders because what an exciting time to be uh, a CIO. I, I think now is the most, uh, the, the CIO's, CIO's ability to be able to modernize, to transform, to find unique solutions is getting is gaining ground. Leaders across the department are understanding that if we don't get the IT modernization right, that impacts everything because all of our equipment is a computer at the end of the day. A tank's a computer, a ship, an airplane. And so the ability to be able to be networked to be able to be in a trusted environment, to be able to be in a secure environment is, uh, is what's number one in, uh, in the department's efforts today. So I would, uh, our CIOs today, I think, have the ability to really make a difference. And, um, and because of what's happening in the world events, our leaders understand the importance of what IT brings to um, the solution, what cybersecurity brings to the solution as we go forward on that. And, and what I like about it now is that the department is reaching out to commercial solutions. There was a time where there kind of was a firewall there between, you know, senior officers believing they could really talk to industry and understand what was going on out there. Um, there were different camps that says you can't do that. If you speak to one industry partner, you got to speak to them all. And, and that barrier has come down. And, and that's because of the great leaders that we have in place today that say that's willing to go out and see what's out there. And when I talk to clients and when I um, talk to them about when they're putting proposals out for a modernization or to recompete something, um, I tell them, you should ask to make sure that you see that you get orals or you get an actual demonstration. Um, you need to be from Missouri and industry. It is the onus is on them to show our uh, government partners that we actually have a solution and it can be delivered as, as we're going through that. And Accenture has made a big commitment uh, in making sure that we have uh, places to go to see uh, actual demonstrations, whether that's in our design studios, or now we have two advanced technology uh, centers. One's located in San Antonio, Texas, and the other one's in St. Louis, Missouri, that we actually can take uh, clients to those locations and they can put their hands on solutions. And I think that is what's going to be important. And our ability to be able to not go big, we don't have to go big right away, but the ability to de to be able to do a pilot to show what results can be as we do that, to be able to field an app at three different bases and show the results of what we're seeing with that. Uh, I think that the government is opening up more and more to those opportunities and that's exciting for us. Susan's absolutely correct. And what I would add is the, like things like, and from a mission perspective, combined joint all domain command and control or operations uh, a joint combined term, right, that's out with respect to mission effectiveness across the services. 
what's really refreshing as a CIO is that that senior level adoption, right? The chiefs and the secretaries recognizing the digital modernization is at the core fabric uh, of all that we do today. As, as Susan mentioned, software is everywhere. It's in the tanks, it's in the ships, it's in the planes, it's in our space platforms. And so if we don't get DevSecOps right, if we don't get our software factories right, if we don't get our digital you know, upskilling of our workforce right, right, we've, we've under, undercut our nation's ability uh, to fight and win in the next next conflict. And so I, there's a fundamental you know, connection there that it used to be IT was a, a, a cost center. I think we're past that. There's a recognition it's not a cost center, it's actually a mission enabler. The, the other thing I would say just from a, well, for one is CIOs don't forget that. You, you must use that as the platform and you must use that as the driver and you must be true to that in your delivery. The, the second piece of it is, is kind of the practicum side of this as a CIO is, I, I always tell folks, know in a, if you look at a maturity model of capability delivery, recognize where you're at and where the next step should be. And so in, in a case of a, either a platform or very legacy centric is, is try to understand um, with, with the industry base, kind of where you sit on that spectrum and be real with yourself about what are the actionable steps you can take to make progress. Again, if you, you're very heavy technical debt and legacy systems, um, there's, there's approaches. And again, this is where the common fabric comes in that you can resonate around a strategy that's not big bang, it's not high risk maneuver, it's, it's an area where you can utilize the trust in digital modernization to your benefit to gain the money and, and make the outcomes uh, happen for the mission that you need to. So I always tell folks, be real with yourself as a CIO. Um, if your security is not there or your software pipeline is not there, focus on those areas to get the basic blocking and tackling because it's so transformational when you talk about data and AI and, and those next steps. Bill, Susan, thank you for the insight that you've shared for where CIOs should start uh, their modernization and their platform uh, initiatives. Uh, you mentioned two really important things, which is the first is uh, software as a service, right? Which was the topic at the beginning of the uh, discussion that we had. And subscription is important when you talk about software because you really only have 12 months to provide value. Right? There's, there's no reason for a customer to stay unless they can actually see this value in, and have the tangibles that you, you highlighted on, uh, especially Susan. And the second is the scalability. Right? It doesn't matter the size that you start, but you want to be able to see that it can be proven out and that it can actually scale. And that is the beauty of a uh, cloud software as a service platform. And so I really appreciate you giving insights to the current and future CIOs on where they should start and how they can have a successful transformation as well. Bill, Susan, I can't thank you enough for your time today, your insights, and the thought-provoking topics that we've shared. I really appreciate your service to the country, the service that you've had uh, uh, to the organization, and the partnership that we have with Accenture Federal. So on behalf of ServiceNow, thank you for this fireside chat and everything that you shared today. Thank you, Aaron, for that. And then also the partnership and uh, across the board with ServiceNow and our airmen, soldiers, sailors uh, across the globe. It's, it's definitely an honor. Thank you. Yes, Aaron, thank you so much. I was proud to serve in uniform. I'm excited to be part of the Accenture Federal Services team now. And uh, for you hosting this, uh, ServiceNow has been a great partner of ours. Thank you, everyone, for spending time with us today on our special fireside chat with our special guests, Bill and Susan.